Welcome to the all-inclusive podcast, please and thank you, where we include all the words and all the topics that you care about. This is episode eight. If you wanted to jump into a different topic, if you want to jump into John Dillerman or Wonder Woman topic, I'm going to leave the time codes below in the description. If you're on the YouTubes, if you're on the Spotify, you are kind of stuck with me until I get to those. But right now, we are on day 947 of quarantine right now we are on the canadas i'm in the canadas countries and we are on lockdown again for the 47th time and uh, it's because of covid 32 yeah a new a new covid came out and uh, this one makes you gag when you eat a lot of pretzels yeah uh, apparently that's not normal so <laughs> we had to we had to lock down again i haven't talked to a human being in a while. The last person I talked to was a cashier at the dollar store. I was at the dollar store because I wanted to do some shopping, you know, and uh, I was talking to the cashier and I got a, a little bit of that uh, social buzz. You know that social buzz? You know that that thing that you get when you're at a networking event or at, at an event and you talk to a bunch of people and you get a bit of that buzz? Yeah, I got a little bit of that. And It was so nice, man. It was so nice. It was like euphoric. It felt so good to just say hi to a cashier. I miss those days, man. I miss those days when you, when we get to talk to strangers. And, you know, I felt over, over time, the last like six months or so, you know, I live in Ottawa and uh, Ottawa is a very nice city. And I don't mean a nice city as in like, you know, everything is nice. I mean, it's a nice city as in, People are very nice here, and whenever I get out of Ottawa, I always notice that niceness, uh, that niceness shift in the way people kind of interact and in the way strangers kind of interact with you. You know, when I go to Toronto, when I go to Montreal, when I go to a different country, I always need to remind myself, oh, right, I'm not in Ottawa. You know, not everybody is like super nice to strangers. You know, people are generally nice everywhere you go. And there's like general level of niceness, you know, but Ottawa has a special kind of niceness. And it's like a little bit more of that small town niceness, you know, when everybody, everybody, everywhere, everybody knows everyone. So it's, it's kind of, it's kind of pretty nice. And I've noticed uh, the whole thing, the whole reason why I'm saying this is because I've noticed that the niceness of the city has gone down pretty significantly. Uh, ever since this COVID lockdown shit happened. And I, I've i noticed that with everybody. I noticed like um, day-to-day people like barbers, retail workers, Uber drivers, like everyone's like very frustrated. There's that frustration. Everyone's anxious. Uh, you know, it's like uh, if you're walking down the sidewalk, uh, some someone will ju- like jump to the other side of the sidewalk just because they don't want to pass by one person. You know, some people are just like so paranoid. And... It's kind of sad, man. It's kind of sad that some people have kind of resorted to that level. But you know what? That's just the reality of things. I guess we don't really have... uh, Some people are lucky in that they they have friends to go visit and whatnot. They have family close by to visit. But some people are, you know, they're a little bit too paranoid and maybe they can't necessarily do that. And uh, or maybe they just, you know, they really want to be strict with the rules, which is... You know, understandable, that's fine. But today, let's get into the one of the topics of today. I want to talk about John Dillerman. Have you heard about the John Dillermans? It's a new animated show. It's a Danish animated children's TV show uh, about a man and his very long penis. Now, it is animated. <laughs> it's not live action. So it's about a man and his very long penis. It premiered very recently. It premiered on January 3rd of 2021. So... You know, only a couple of days from the filming of this episode, it premiered at a at a Danish kids TV channel show. It's a show that's aimed at four to eight year olds. And John Dillerman, the premise of the show is this guy named John Dillerman. And it's a he's a middle aged man and he has a penis that can extend to a length of dozens of meters. And uh, John uses his penis as a tool such as to tame lions or to fly um, a helicopter but sometimes it acts independently of john getting him into trouble so the show is is spread into five minute segments i watched a few episodes on the youtubes you can check that out i highly recommend it it's getting a lot of the criticisms you know because it's a kid's show and it's got a guy with a dick 
But uh, the guy's dick is literally like a candy cane. So honestly, if if someone did honestly, if someone didn't point out that this was supposed to be his dick, I wouldn't have put that together. Uh, maybe I'm a dumbass, but uh, I would have just thought it was like he was some sort of mutant or some shit. But because, you know, it's widely covered and so many people are talking about it, you know, I kind of got that. Oh, OK, this is supposed to be his dick. It's it's a pretty funny show. It was developed in collaboration with sex education organization with a sex education organization named Sex and Sam Fund, uh, which is a sex education organization in uh, the Danish in Denmark. Uh, so it's a nonprofit organization. So it was done in collaboration with those people. But it's been getting some criticism online. So the show was generally met, according to CNN, uh, CNN's article ro- uh, written by Rob Pichita. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Pichita. I'm going to put a link of the description, uh, link of that uh article below in the YouTube description, if you're listening to it on that. Uh, The show was generally met with hilarity in Denmark and across the internet, with many praising it as an appropriate and lighthearted way to teach children about the human anatomy. A handful of people took issue with the main character's central trait, and some people, I did read some people giving it some criticism. I'm not quite sure if those people honestly watched the show. I think they just kind of heard of the premise of the show, and then they were like, what the hell? This is crazy. We shouldn't be showing this to kids because kids shouldn't be aware of their dicks. So um, one of the one of the criticisms that they got is from Facebook, uh, from a parent. I don't know why they just highlighted that one parent that had a problem with it. Uh, the parent says, I don't know if it's a man or a woman. It says, I am mildly shaken and shocked by the line you are currently choosing. I don't get what they mean by a line. Maybe it was mistranslated. I am deeply outraged and think it is so perverse and inappropriate television for young children. Another professor and gender researcher, Christian Groves. I didn't even know there was something called the gender researcher. I didn't even know we needed those, but apparently that's a thing. Uh, So he said he believes it's perpetuating the standard idea of a patriarchal society. Holy fuck, that guy is going somewhere. Patriarchal society and normalizing locker room culture that's been used to excuse a lot of bad behavior from men. Okay, that's a little bit of a stretch there, but, you know, that's one of the criticisms that it's been getting. There's a lot of, well, not a lot, but there's been a few child psychologists and clinical psychologists that backed up the show, including the show's, um, the public channel that it was on also backed up the show. One of the things this clinical psychologist was saying, uh, he was saying that uh, the the show who worked, um, the guy who, the clinical psychologist who works with families and children said she believed the show's opponents may be over, overthinking things and that John Dillerman talks to children and shares their way of thinking and kids do find genitals funny. So I watched a few episodes and I thought, uh, a few episodes and I thought the show was more about just like embracing your inner weirdness. Like if you have some weird ass dick or some shit, it's like about accepting who you are. That's kind of the vibe that I got from this. I didn't think it was it was something to be contro- like to be shaken by, to be like, oh, I'm never gonna show my kids this. But you know, some people like to kind of jump on that bad bandwagon. And I'm not quite sure if a lot of people have a problem with it. And because when I was reading a lot of YouTube comments, People seem to be seem to find that show very funny, and they seem to be very okay with it. Um, I think this is one of those situations where people are just focusing on the the few people that have a problem with the show. That's kind of how it is. It's like it's like when Louis C.K. came back and did a, a stand up show. There was like one person that had a problem with the fact that he was he was on stage, and someone was like, "Oh my God, I felt forced." to watch him or some shit and it's like look if he if he makes you uncomfortable totally cool like just walk out of the show but but the person ended up writing a whole article about it and it's like apparently he killed in that show according to people that have been on there but anyway i think that's kind of where people are coming from is that uh, bill burr had a there was a there was a short clip i was watching on youtube 
and it was by the YouTube channel Netflix as a joke. So they were promoting Netflix as a joke. So they were promoting a uh, a show on Netflix, a Netflix original. I'm not sure which show they were promoting. I just saw that Bill Burr was on it and a bunch of people were interviewing him. So these bunch of people were talking to Bill Burr and they were asking him, they were telling him, you know, some people thought he got a lot of flack for his SNL monologue. If you haven't watched his SNL monologue, it's very funny. And this girl was saying, like, a lot of people got mad from your SNL monologue. So Bill Burr replied and he says, no one got mad from my SNL monologue. It's just that they interviewed the people that did. And I thought that was a really (laughs) interesting point that most people are probably okay with this animated show. It's pretty absurd and it's so ridiculous um i would recommend checking out an episode it's literally only five minutes and it's an animated show it's just so stupid uh but it's funny i think it's worth actually putting that show on adult swim if they haven't already they should like because uh because they i think they're they're going somewhere pretty funny with it they have some uh like i like their comedy style it's pretty absurd pretty stupid but you know it is what it is but i think that's kind of where this show's criticism comes from is people that haven't watched it and it's only a handful of people that actually have a genuine problem with it and it just so happens that those people are the ones that are the ones that are getting the attention every article likes to cover controversies and controversies gets a lot of clicks even like i made a pay i made a web a youtube video about a controversy with uh well it's not really much of a controversy it was more of an announcement but when ellen page announced that she is turning into a he and i just said oh okay i didn't know that was a thing and i was just talking about it pretty casually on my video and that ended up getting for my channel even though that it's not much but uh for my channel ended up getting a couple of hundred views which was pretty good for my channel uh given how small it is so in comparison to a lot of the other videos, which got like, you know, 100, 200 views or something like that, but that video got a lot more and it was because it was controversy. So people like controversy. People like it when there is an article or a video where there's a bunch of people that disagree with a bun- other bunch of people. And I do think that over over the past few years, um, I've noticed that people have gotten a lot more sensitive. And it is kind of scary because it makes me wonder, like, where are we going with this? Like, how are we going to go? How, where are we going to go like five, ten years from now when everything like people don't want to say something? because it's going to get them into co- some controversy or some shit. It's like some TV show doesn't want to say something or some movie doesn't want to make a specific joke because they don't want to get into controversy. And it's kind of scary, man, because it's like I'm not exactly sure where we're going, but I'm I'm just a little bit like concerned. I remember dating this girl that was like 21 years old um 2 years ago. And I genuinely felt like she was way more sensitive than a lot of the other girls that I've dated that usually were in around the mid-20s. And I felt the same way with another another girl that was like around 22. Um, some, well, not just girls, but even guys um, seem to be more sensitive and there's like more of a paranoia where it's like, oh, I don't know if I want to talk about that. Like that seems to be spreading out um, to a lot of people and it's being spread out to a lot of different pockets all over the world where it's like people are just hesitant to talk about specific topics now i'm lucky that i have a lot of outgoing friends that generally get to say whatever is on their mind but i also understand that sometimes when i go to like certain events um or i meet certain groups of people there's going to be that hesitation to talk about certain topics or make jokes about certain topics or whenever they say something that's even like I, I don't know, has something to do with gender or race, they're going to just stop themselves from talking and uh, or they're going to try to justify themselves. Sorry, that's probably a better way to say it. They're, they try to justify themselves um, on why they said what they said. So it's like, dude, you don't need to justify everything you're saying. Sometimes, you know, just gotta, you just got to speak your mind. But anyway, moving on to the next topic of the day. So recently, I ended up re-watching the first Wonder Woman in preparation of the sequel, Wonder Woman 1984. So I am 
I was amazed by how good that movie was, the first one. It is. It was directed, I think it was directed by Patty Jenkins. And I think the story was written by Zack Snyder and a couple of other people. But man, that is such a good movie. It's one of my favorite superhero movies. It's definitely in the top 10. You know, the ending wasn't that great. And apparently Patty Jenkins actually had uh, didn't have anything to do with the ending. Like it was like at the studios, the studios wanted Warner Brothers were actually the ones that wanted some sort of big epic fight between the villain and Wonder Woman at the end. And the original ending wasn't that. And Patty Jenkins is kind of a little bit pissed off that the reason the the big thing that people have the big criticism that people have of the first one is of the ending and she's like I didn't even want that ending but you know it is what it is sometimes you just got to do what you got to do so I d- watched that in preparation for the second movie Wonder Woman 1984 and the movie was directed by Patty Jenkins and it was also co-written by her. So she hasn't written a movie since I think Monster. I might 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 have gotten that wrong, but I think the last movie she wrote was Monster. Um, and I also talked a lot about Patty Jenkins in a different video. I'm gonna link it in the description below on the YouTube's. And if you're on the Spotify's, you know, go on my channel. There's a video with Patty Jenkins' face on it as the thumbnail, and that's the one where I talked about Patty Jenkins. I talked about how she kind of got into into directing and whatnot and what some of her successes and her first movie etc so on and so forth so this is the first movie that she's courting in a while i think and pedro pascal is also in the movie so if you haven't watched if you're not familiar who pedro pascal is you will be more familiar with him as time goes on because he is the main star of the mandalorian he is the mandalorian in the mandalorian so he plays the villain in Wonder Woman 1984. So the first Wonder Woman is freaking amazing. As I was saying, it's one of my favorite movies, uh, favorite uh, superhero movies in particular. I'd probably put it in like a top number eight or a number nine in like a top 10 list. You know, there's so many good ones. There's like Avengers, Iron Man, Doctor Strange, Ant-Man. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of really good ones, Captain America, Winter Soldier. But I would definitely put Wonder Woman up there in the top 10s. It was so good. There it took me on an emotional roller coaster and I had some, you know, expectations for the second one. Now, there were the, the second one wasn't terrible. And some people do are giving it a lot of hate and they're saying that it was shit and I'm not going to put any spoilers in this. But the second one wasn't terrible. I still think it's worth watching if you're curious to see how the movie turned out and where all the criticism is coming from. But if you are more of a casual viewer of of the superhero movies, you know, you kind of just watch whatever is really good. You don't really want to watch anything. You kind of, like you would avoid the Thor Thor 1, Thor 2 because, you know, people say, oh, well, it's not as good as the other ones. So you kind of just avoid that. Then that's understandable. In that case, I wouldn't recommend watching Wonder Woman 1984. However... If you are curious to see how the movie turned out, I definitely recommend it. Um, I do think it was enjoyable in some instances. There were some really good scenes, especially those scenes. All the there was like a bunch of scenes in the White House that were done, and there was a confrontation between the first time Cheetah and Wonder Woman face off. All that stuff, really cool. And I think uh, there were some like you know there are Chris Pine's in it too, and Chris Pine's being Chris Pine. He's awesome as Chris Pine. But I felt like there was a lot of problems with the movie. I felt like the pacing was very off. There were points where I was bored. And I'm not... I was just like, am I just bored of this? Because I was watching it at home. But I remember a few weeks ago, I was just watching the first Wonder Woman again. I was re-watching it. I don't remember ever being bored with that and the f- the movie the the sequel just felt like it was dragging on a lot there were some points that were awesome but it was just dragging on too much the script didn't seem to be that great which is very disappointing because patty jenkins co-wrote this and i, I had some high, some expectations that you know she was gonna bring her a game because of the success of the first one but it seems to me that she let the first one get in her head a little bit too much. Like the success of the first movie was was so much 
to her that she will she may have became become overconfident with the sequel. That's kind of the vibe that I got. It was I got that I got the vibe that she was a little bit overconfident with this one, which is which is kind of disappointing. It's like uh, uh, you know, but here's the thing. I don't want to stick too much on the negatives. There was a lot, um, in this one compared to the previous one. There was a lot of color, which I liked. You know, it was more vibrant. It had a very 80s kind of look. It's it's very 80s actually. They kind of like slap. They kind of like slap you in the face with the 80s vibe. They continuously remind you of how 80s this movie is. It's like remember the 80s. Remember 80s movies. Remember like the old 2000s, 90s movies and their style. And it's like this is kind of like that. Remember how good those movies are. And there there's a lot of that. There is a lot of that, and I don't quite, I don't think that. I think the style and the artistic direction they went to is pretty cool, but not so much the uh, the direction that they ended up taking with the movie, the cheesiness of the movie. Like just from the very intro, when the big, when the movie starts, and you see freaking Wonder Woman like like whipping her lasso of truth around like Spider Man style, and it's just the whole thing is. It's pretty well choreographed, but it was very cheesy. And it was like a lot of really cool ideas all spread around, but it just wasn't very well executed. And there were some really cool moments overall, but over I would say overall, like they kind of, uh, they were going for a more cheesy, cartoonish kind of style from the very beginning of the movie all the way to the end, which is very different from the first one, which took a much more darker, more serious tone. In comparison to the second one. And I do appreciate that they decided to go from a different direction. That's the thing. Like I do appreciate that they went for a more cartoonish look. For a more, more cartoonish uh, vibe. Compared to the previous one. Because here's the thing. Like uh, people have been talking about this a lot. They've been talking about superhero fatigue. And there, some people are trying to figure out. It's like how do we get rid of superhero fatigue? How do we avoid getting into superhero fatigue where people continuously look forward to the next superhero movie you know something that happened to guitar hero uh, if you don't remember what guitar hero is it was a movie sorry not a movie it was a video game where you have a literally a plastic guitar where you play with a guitar and you play along with song and people got guitar hero fatigue because literally every freaking guitar hero game was exactly like the previous one and it was very disappointing uh, because there was never anything new with the with the gameplay. They always added a little bit of a twist here and there with the gameplay. But overall, it was pretty much the same shit. It was pretty much the same concept. And Activision ended up milking the shit out of that series. And unfortunately, it ended up getting to a point where it sold. And it, like, it went from selling like 10 plus million copies to barely 100,000 because of how much it was getting milked. So how do you avoid that fatigue? And one of the ways to do it, one of the main ways, I think, personally, is to always keep things fresh, always keep things new. And as long as they take, take different directions that are a little bit more risky, um, it won't have that kind of superhero fatigue. For example, Doctor Strange, uh, the first one, um, it took this more psychedelic approach to its visuals, although the story and the pacing were very similar to like a lot of other superhero movies, the villain wasn't, the ending wasn't, the final fight wasn't, the the psychedelic kind of visuals weren't. So there was always that little bit of newness to it that you weren't familiar with other uh, that you weren't familiar with. It was like one of those like ninety percent familiar, twenty percent, ten to twenty percent, like eighty to ninety percent familiar, ten to twenty percent different. And I think that as long as superheroes kind of keep doing that. Um, we and as long as they you know actually put the effort to make them good and not always play it safe, we won't have that superhero fatigue. So the whole reason why I'm saying this is because I felt like that's kind of why Patty Jenkins and you know her team decided to go with that direction, that cart- cartoonish early 2000s superhero movie direction, which was very different from the previous Wonder Woman. That. I appreciate, I appreciate the different direction. Unfortunately, the execution was not done well. It was poorly executed, poorly paced. um, There wasn't much of a deep story. The characters, uh, you know, the character arcs of like Chris Pine, of Wonder Woman, 
isn't really that great. It doesn't really make much of a, an impact. You know, she goes through this whole thing when she's a kid that they show us in the beginning of the movie. And I didn't really felt like they went back to it in any way. I mean, they, they sort of hinted at it. And I was just like, I don't really think that's like a good way to, to kind of have a callback. To the, oh, remember that previous lesson you learned when you were a kid? It's kind of the same thing now as you've gotten older. And it doesn't, it just doesn't, it just doesn't really click, man. It just doesn't really click. That's all I have for today's podcast, please. And thank you. Thank you guys for joining another episode. We will be back next Monday. As always, peace out. Peace <laughs> out.